You will hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You'll hear a head teacher and a teacher discussing a school camping trip. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Mr. Thompson says he's just finished looking through the reports, so B has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year ten. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the twenty-third to the twenty-sixth, if I'm not mistaken. Ah,、uh, actually, I think it's the twenty-fourth to the twenty-seventh. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So, well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching, and I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and is that the campsite in the Lake District? No, actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid five pounds a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid ten pounds for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only four pounds per night. And they told me that if we had over fifty children, which we do, they could give us a further ten percent off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. Okay. So now these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes. Go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around seven on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At eight, we could have a barbecue. You know, hamburgers and hot dogs. Something that's nice and easy to prepare. And that children love. Yes. Then lights out would be at nine thirty, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at seven on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at seven thirty, an hour's hiking from eight till nine, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to eleven. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know. Yes, great idea. And then, let's see. A picnic lunch at twelve, and then sports in the afternoon till four. Another swim until five, and then supper. After clean up around six thirty, we could have a talk back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing along at eight. Back to the tents at nine thirty, and well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent, excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right? As on Saturday, same wake up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim. And then lunch at one. Then we could have organised games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well, now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You'll hear a man giving information to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, University of Radstock students, and thank you for coming out today. As some of you may already know, my name is Scott Barnes, and I am the director of the Student Services Office here at the university. I'm here today to give you some information about what Student Services has to offer you. To begin with, let me just say that I feel that our office will play an important role in the way that all of you will experience your time here at Radstock as students. Primarily, our center is geared towards providing answers to any questions you may have. Because all of our reception staff are currently enrolled as students at Radstock, we feel that we're in an excellent position to deal with any issues you may face during your time here at the university. 
As I said earlier, the Student Services Office is mainly a place where you can have your queries answered. However, the office is more than that. For example, if you come and visit us, you can pick up your student discount cards. Now, with these cards, which come at no additional cost to you, you can take advantage of reductions of up to 40% on all forms of public transport in the city. In addition, the cards are honored at many shops and restaurants in the area, giving you the chance to save up to 35% off food, beverages, and other purchases. Our office is also the place you should visit if you would like to get involved in any of the 30 different clubs and societies available at Radstock. Come in any time between 10 and 3 on weekdays and sign up to become a member of the university choir or orchestra, the drama or debating club, the university trivia team, the list goes on and on. For new students, I cannot stress enough how vital it is to participate in the non-academic side of university life. Yes, we are here to work hard and do our best at our studies, but student life is also about having fun and meeting like-minded people. So, bearing that in mind, make sure that you get involved and enjoy yourselves. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Moving along, I'd now like to talk to you about another very important service that our office provides, and that is counseling. I'm sure that you are all well aware that there are times in life when things can go wrong and times can get tough. We all have to endure difficult experiences, and these difficulties can be emotional or physical. Whatever the case may be, Talking with an experienced counselor can help you through the trying times. The counseling service here at Radstock is staffed by counselors who are qualified to help you deal with problems ranging from homesickness and loneliness to eating difficulties and life changes. To see a counselor, we recommend that you first visit our drop-in center. We run drop-in sessions on a daily basis from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., and to reserve one of these sessions, you can telephone the counseling service on 121-5648-3907 on the day you wish to visit. Or, if you prefer, you can come into the student services office any time after 8.30 a.m., and complete a booking form. If it should happen that you need to cancel your appointment for the drop-in session, we would request that you contact the counseling service as soon as possible to let them know. Drop-in sessions can be as short as 20 minutes, but it's more usual for them to take about 45 minutes. During that time, you will be asked some questions to clarify your situation, and a decision will be made as to what further action, if any, should be taken. After your session, several things may happen. Firstly, you may be referred to one of the university's counselors for further counseling, which normally consists of another eight sessions. Secondly, you may be asked to visit another source of help within the university. Or, finally, you may be referred to an external organization. Whatever course of action might be taken, you may rest assured that what goes on in these sessions is treated in strict confidence. I'd also like to mention that the counseling service runs numerous workshops on the campus every year. The focus of these workshops tends to be on personal development, and past topics have included motivation, self-identity, and impression management. There is no fee charged for these workshops, and if you require more information, feel free to contact us at 
struser at acadia.co.uk. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear a tutor and a student talking about the history of the scientific method. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Simon. Come in. Take a seat. Now, I wanted to talk to you about your assignment. Yes, the one on the scientific method. That's right. I just wanted to see how you were getting on. Well, I think it's fine. I mean, I haven't done a huge amount of work on it because I've been working on other things. But what I've read so far seems fine. How many of the references that I gave you have you managed to get hold of? Not too many, I'm afraid. It seems that everyone else is working on the same things at the same time. And every time I look, the books are checked out from the library. Right. Well, I think that we can go over the main ground together now. That way, even if you don't manage to go through all the references in detail, you'll still have an overview. What has helped you most so far? I've managed to have a look at three of them. I thought that Johnson made some good points, but it was hard to follow the line of her argument. Bradman was simple and straightforward, and I felt as if I got a lot out of that. I wish I could say the same for Whitaker. To be honest, I didn't get very far with that. OK, that's more or less what I'd expect. So tell me, what have you learned so far about the role of the Egyptians and the Babylonians? Yes. Well, there's evidence that the basic components of the scientific method, examination, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis, were being used in the early 1600s BC especially in the treatment of certain illness. Good. Yes, that's right. And the point, of course, is that that represented a considerable advance over relatively simple, non-empirical approaches, which usually attributed anything unknown to the actions of the gods, etc. Of course, the Egyptians and Babylonians did this as well, but what we see emerging here is a willingness to base opinion on systematic study of the real world, which is at the root of the scientific method. I see. Right. Yes. And then that reappears later. Yes. Although don't get carried away with the idea that it was a simple process of development. By the time we get to ancient Greece, let's take the period towards the middle of the 5th century BC, the rules governing the scientific method were practiced on a widespread scale, but there were still many people who believed that real truth could only be acquired by pure rational thought. Plato, of course, had a great influence on the development of the scientific method during this period. Through his academy. That's right. But then, as we know, a great deal of understanding of the scientific method disappeared as the old world order collapsed. It wasn't until the Middle Ages, sometime before the 11th century, that several versions of the scientific method emerged from the medieval Muslim world, all of which stressed the importance of experimentation in science. Right. I think I've got the historical timeline. 
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The other thing I'm struggling with slightly is actually pinning down precisely what we mean by the scientific method. I wonder if you could give me some pointers on that. Sure. Well, it's best to think of the scientific method as a series of steps in a process which allows us to find answers to questions about the world around us. So the first step is to identify the problem. What is it that you want to know or explain? And then I think the next step is designing an experiment. Hmm, but you can't design an experiment unless you know what you want your experiment to tell you. Oh, yes. You need to form a hypothesis to be tested before you design the experiment. So, there's a very clear relationship between hypothesis and experiment. Having designed the experiment, then of course you go on to carry out the experiment. The particular procedure you follow, the protocol, will differ from experiment to experiment, but the underlying principle is the same. You analyse the data from the experiment in order to confirm or disprove your hypothesis. Assuming the experiment is accurate. Oh, yes. If there's anything unusual about the data, or if the results are at all surprising, then you need to ask yourself whether the experiment could be flawed and whether the data could be unreliable. If the answer is yes, then it may be necessary to modify the experiment and go through the process again. So, once you have reliable, valid results... Then the final step is to communicate them. The wider scientific community needs to know about the results, and publication in journals is the accepted way. OK. I think I've got the basics. It's going to get more complicated as we begin to look at some people who have criticised the scientific method. So you need to make sure that you understand things up to this point. Let me know if you have any further problems with it. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You'll hear a teacher talking about several British art galleries. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first class of V100 Art and History. The objectives of the course, as you will have seen if you've taken a look at the syllabus, include familiarizing yourselves with the vocabulary and language of art, learning about the basic elements of art and design, and finally, discussing historical periods as they pertain to art. The course will also give you the opportunity to visit some of the many galleries and museums that Britain has to offer. So, having said that, I'd like to spend the rest of today's class talking about four of the more important galleries that we will be visiting in the coming year.
As most of you already know, or at least I hope most of you know, there are four Tate galleries in all. To begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Tate Modern. Tate Modern is located in a very busy part of London called the South Bank. It's close to two world-renowned tourist attractions, St. Paul's Cathedral and Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Now, interestingly enough, Tate Modern is housed in what was a power station, built in several stages between 1947 and 1963. It was closed down in 1981 and reopened as a gallery in the year 2000. Tate Modern consists of five levels, with the Tate Collection being shown on the third and fifth levels. On level two, the works of contemporary artists are exhibited, while level four is used for holding large temporary exhibitions. Since this museum opened, it has become a popular spot for both Londoners and tourists alike. And believe it or not, it doesn't cost anything to get in to see the collection displays. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Now, the second gallery I'd like to talk about is Tate St. Ives, which is in Cornwall. It was built on the site of a gas works, and it overlooks Porthmure Beach. Tate St. Ives is housed in a three-story building that was designed by the architects Evans and Shalliff. It was established in 1993, seven years before Tate Modern was opened, and the gallery exhibits the works of modern British artists, including members of the St. Ives School, a group of artists living and working in the area from the 30s onwards. In later lectures, we'll be looking at the work of some of the artists who belong to that group and the ways in which they influenced each other. Okay, am I going too fast for any of you? No? Good. Next, I want to talk about Tate Britain, which is a gorgeous gallery situated right in the heart of Westminster. Tate Britain was the first of the four Tate galleries to open, and it was established in 1897. It was built on the site of an old prison, and when it first opened its doors, it was called the National Gallery of British Art. Later, it became known as the Tate Gallery, after the man who founded it, Sir Henry Tate. During its lifetime, Tate Britain has been damaged twice, once by floodwaters from the River Thames, and once by bombings during World War II. This gallery has an interesting range of exhibitions of historic and modern art from 1500 up to the present day. Now, the last gallery I'd like to tell you about is called Tate Liverpool. It's not hard to figure out where this gallery is located, is it? It was opened in 1988 to exhibit displays from the Tate Collection, and it also has a program of temporary exhibitions. Tate Liverpool is housed in what was once a warehouse, and for some years it was one of the biggest galleries of modern and contemporary art in the UK. Well, that's a brief overview of just a few of the galleries we'll be visiting. I'd like now to look in a little more detail at what you can expect to see in each of these galleries, starting with Tate Britain. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.